Oh, 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 God. Oh, God. Oh, oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ew, ew, ew. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, oh, no, no, you're cute. You're cute. I, I, I don't want to pet you, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, all right. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, uh, what are you going to do? Oh, uh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Oh, oh, no, okay. No, yeah, no, this, this spray is not for me. Yeah, the light at which... Uh, lighthouses can be seen at sea, as well as the fact that uh, canals, tunnels, and railroads are never built with curvature in mind whatsoever. That's not necessary. And if there were, then the, their plans would be off, in fact. I've got quotes in my book from railroad engineers and canal builders saying how <laughs> it's absolutely, it's hard enough for railroads to turn, make curves uh, horizontally, let alone if we were on a ball and railroads would have to be curving up on the ball and they give examples of different railroads over the earth and how long they are and how much curvature they'd have to be ascending and how it would be so impossible for the trains to, to be able to go up this curve because trains are made to be on a level. They just can't, they just can't operate that way. <laughs> so there's a lot, of, a lot of proofs like that. Eric Dubé is again getting all his quotes and information from 19th century flat earth texts. If he would open a book written in the past hundred years or so, he would know that trains can and do indeed go up hills, albeit very shallow ones. A train has a maximum gradient of around 2.5%. This however is not an issue for the curvature of the earth as that gradient is around 0.01%. You mentioned uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and one compelling thing you have in your documentary is Neil deGrasse Tyson is on TV and he's talking about the shape of the Earth, and he's talking about how they just discovered now that the Earth is more pear-shaped than it is round. So Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning, and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere. It's, an, it's oblate, and officially it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, we've been seeing pictures of the Earth from space, and it's a perfect circle. So either you don't know what you're talking about, or those pictures aren't real. Uh, this is a serious disconnect that's hard to rectify, Neil. Absolutely, yeah. And they, they've said that it's a sphere, and then they've said that it's an oblate spheroid flattened at the poles, so it's kind of like smushed. And now more recently they're saying it's an oblate spheroid flattened at the poles with a bulge in the south, so it's kind of pear-shaped. Uh, so they keep changing it, but you're right, the, the pictures that they've given us, they show a perfect circle. Uh, they don't show uh, any sort of bulge or oblateness as they claim exists. The difference in length between the polar and equatorial axes would be damn near indistinguishable from space. That's why the Earth doesn't look like a fucking pear in NASA images. Fucking idiot. Uh, and, and people say, oh, well, it's, it's just not enough to be seen. But uh, they're claiming it's quite a bit. He said it's uh, the amount of Everest above sea level is how much more oblate it is, supposedly. Right, you would think that would show up in the pictures. <laughs> Everest would also be too small to be seen from the distance NASA is taking pictures. The Discover satellite, for example, is 930,000 miles away from Earth. And you expect to see the five mile blip that is Everest in its images? Stupid idiots. Now, a lot of people's first question is going to be, well, where's the edge? And I was surprised to uh, see how easy that is to rectify, but it, I'm sure you get that a lot. How do you tell people when they come at you with, well, where's the edge? Why aren't people sailing off the edge or whatever? Keep your ears open for every time Eric describes the flat earth as a model. He's not using model in the model car sense but rather in the scientific model sense. He does this in a vain attempt to add some sort of scientific legitimacy to his story. So in the flat earth model, the North Pole is in the middle. 
and the Earth is a disk shape, and the Antarctica is all the way around holding the oceans in. And so it's a fact if you're at the North Pole and you go south, no matter which, uh, actually it doesn't matter where you are, if you go south, eventually you're going to end up in Antarctica. But on the ball model, it's just a little ice continent underneath the ball. Technically, it's a continent covered with ice. The Arctic would benefit your description here. Also, it's not little. Antarctica is about the size of the U.S. plus Mexico. Yet in this model, it's all the way around you, holding the oceans in. As for whether there's an edge beyond the Antarctic ice plateau, this wall that holds everything in is about 100 to 200 feet tall, and once you climb up on the ice wall, it's a plateau of snow that just goes on and on and on. I swear Eric has never bothered to look up any facts about Antarctica. The continent has highly varied topography. It is about as far from a plateau as you can get. Uh, and the public and myself are ignorant at the moment as to whether it, there is an edge at some point, whether there'd be a barrier, a dome, uh, as many ancient cultures have said there is, or whether it's an infinite flat plain and it's just snow, ice, wind, and darkness forever. So that's still a mystery, uh, how the ice actually terminates. Sadly, the hundreds of scientists they have explored Antarctica can't be trusted because they are all evil Freemasons. But it, it is a fact that if you travel south from anywhere on Earth, you will end up at the Antarctic ice wall. Um, the lie is that there's a south pole and they've put a ceremonial red and white barbershop pole with a ball Earth on top of it at an arbitrary point along the Antarctic ice. And they even admit that it's not the actual South Pole. And they have this complex model how the North and South Poles on the ball Earth are constantly moving because of the, the nature of the uh, magnetic, molten magnetic core of the ball Earth they claim exists. Eric fails to mention that his lovely ball Earth barbershop pole has a sign right behind it saying that it marks the geographic South Pole. Eric appears to be confusing the geographic South Pole with the geomagnetic South Pole. Uh, but the real thing, real reason is they have guided tours there to the South Pole, and if you took a compass and you stood at their ceremonial pole, you should be able to walk in a circle and north would be in every direction. But of course that wouldn't happen, and so they'd have to answer to all these tourists every year as to why the South Pole clearly isn't the South Pole. And they even admit it, you can see on YouTube, and they give their complex answer as to why it's always moving and you can never really find it. I think Eric is trying to convince us that modern geodynamo theory is nothing more than an ad hoc theory given to tourists at the South Pole to explain their compass needles. I don't understand how this is a refutation. It's not even an argument. Eric is just saying it's too confusing, so it's wrong. It's the entire flat earth argument in a nutshell, really. I don't get it, so it's wrong. SMRT! I mean SMART! Same with the North Pole, in fact. If you watch North Pole documentaries, they always claim they're at the North Pole, but they're only showing a Garmin with 90 degrees north latitude. They never pull out a compass to actually check if they're at the North Pole. They're just on some ice somewhere, it could be anywhere on Earth, and then they're like, three feet, two feet, one feet, we're at the North Pole. Given the vast amounts of research Flat Earthers claim to do, you think the brightest among them would know the difference between the geomagnetic pole and the geographic pole? No. It's just some random ice, you know, nothingness. So yeah, it's, it's easy to lie about these things. And these no man's lands, the North Pole and the Antarctica, they don't allow us to independently explore them. So people like Rodney Clough or Jarl Andehoy, independent explorers who've 
wanted to go to the North Pole and Antarctica without getting government pre-approval and only going with their escorts to the uh, places they want you to go. They've actually been turned around at gunpoint by military vessels not allowing them to go in. Yarland Hoys faced jail time and uh, fines for it as well. So uh, they definitely don't want us exploring what is in the, uh, the middle of the flat earth and on the edges. They keep us in the middle. Rodney Clough is a hollow earth blogger, and I cannot find anything about him being denied entry to Antarctica. Yaw Anderhoy is a venturer who has sailed all over the world. He has gotten into legal trouble with various countries while trying to access North and South Poles for not having the proper permits and insurances. Interesting how he's not a flat earther though. Perhaps Eric should look up Brian Waters and Cecile Skog for an example of someone who has crossed Antarctica without a guide. Plenty of other people have done it too.